Hello, I'm Corinne Armour, author of Leaders Who Ask, Building Fearless Cultures by Telling Less and Asking More and Developing Direct Reports. Today on the show, we're going to talk about guerrilla leadership. Do you need it? Why do you need it? And the power of asking more questions and being willing to give up a little bit of control, stop telling and start asking. Congratulations! You are tuned into Dove Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dove Barron, is the founder of FullMontyLeadership.com. He's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dov Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dov Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of leadership excellence. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives, part of the Full Monty interview series. I'm your host, Dov Barron. I'm the founder of Full Monty Leadership, and I'm here to assist you tapping into the one thing in your business that changes everything. Let me ask you, are you committed to up-leveling your leadership? Do you sometimes find yourself struggling due to fear? Fear is normal. Fear can be healthy, or it can be debilitating. As we get into this show, I want you to consider this. Who was the leader who, in spite of your fear, taught you to lead? Remember, you can chat about this episode or any past episodes by going to either our Facebook page or our LinkedIn page. Just look for Leadership and Loyalty Podcast. If you're a new listener, new viewer, thank you for joining us. Strap yourself in. We're about to go full body. As always, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever you tune into podcasts. We always need your help in staying relevant, so please get over there rate, review, and subscribe to the channel. You can catch us on traditional radio stations across the United States every Monday and Thursday, all the way from Las Vegas to Florida, and even up into Washington, DC. You can also find us on Roku TV, where there's over 100,000 subscribers. And if you're a regular listener, big thank you to you for making us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners, with a potential reach of 2.5 to 4 million listeners for every single show. We're honored and grateful to be cited by Inc.com as the number one podcast to make you a better leader. And you can also catch us on Spotify, Google Home, and Alexa by simply saying, play Dove Barron Podcast. Again, thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. All right, let's strip it down and dive right in. As a leader, whether you're a CEO, someone in the C-suite, a sales leader, an entrepreneur, a leader in any capacity, you will, without doubt, be forced into situations that are uncomfortable and at times maybe even terrifying. But what does it take to become a fearless leader? What does it take to lead when you're afraid? Or are you playing it safe? To paraphrase Hunter S. Thompson, life and leadership should not be a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving safely, but rather to skid in broadside in a cloud of smoke, thoroughly used up, totally worn out, and loudly proclaiming, wow, that was a ride. What if that became your definition of leadership? How? Well, let me tell you. You're going to find out right now. Our guest on this episode is Corinne Amwa. Now, Corinne is a leadership speaker, trainer, coach who helps leaders, teams, and organizations face what she calls fearless leadership. With an impressive corporate career in the Australian banking sector with more than 10 years, she has had a focus her energy and attention on helping develop leadership in others. Corinne is the author of two books on leadership, Developing Direct Reports, Taking the Guesswork Out of Leading Leaders, and her recent smash hit, Leaders Who Ask, Building Fearless Cultures by Telling Less and Asking More. If you're committed to building empowering teams, triggering innovation, harnessing the genius of the people around you, and building a fearless culture, then you're going to love what Corinne has to share. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me to welcome the Aussie country girl who became the fearless guerrilla fighter for leadership, Corinne Amor! <laughs> Thank you, Dove. You're very welcome. It's good to have you here. I'm really excited about this show. I'm really looking forward to this. Me too. 
Good. Early, Excellent. early in the morning here in Australia. Yeah, you, uh, it's, it's uh, moving towards my evening and it's moving to, into your very early morning. So thanks for getting up early in Australia to, to have this combo with us. Now, you know, what, the, one of the questions I like to start my show with is to ask the question, who has been somebody who has impacted you, influenced you in leadership, uh, who we might not know? But I have a little bit of an insight in this one um, because in the intro, intro to this show right now, I talked about your background in the banking sector, um, which is, could be a little, conceived as a little boring. Uh, <laughs> But what I didn't oh, tell everybody, up, <laughs> what I didn't tell everybody up front is that you've been a great adventurer, and one of your adventures was working and living in a jungle refugee camp at the edge of a war zone, and that that might be the place where you met the person who taught you about leadership. So tell us that story because that is absolutely fascinating. Well, I think I met three key people actually in the jungle who oh, taught me wow. about leadership, but. Uh, Perhaps if I start with my very first night in the jungle. Thank so you. I um, was, in, I had a little bamboo house and I was in my house and I had been fed dinner and I finished my dinner and I sat and it was starting to get dark outside and I thought, oh, now what? And I was just this overcome with complete fear. I was just paralyzed and asking myself questions like, how did I get here? I'm, I'm just a girl who grew up on a farm in country Australia. I don't speak the language. I've never, I don't know anything about warfare. I've never been in a war zone. You know, what am I doing here and how do I get out? And I was just so afraid I lost track of time and it might've been seconds, minutes. It could have even been, you know, half an hour or more. And, and then I, I heard a noise and I looked up and this, um, this leader who taught me so much came in and um, she smiled at me and, you know, she wasn't, you, you said I came from banking, which is boring, which, you know, isn't always true. Not always. And um, so, so she real. didn't look at all like a banker. You know, she came in, she was tatty, um, she was dirty because this was a refugee camp. Um, and she reached forward and she took my hand. And, and this little leader, she, little, she was four. Now, age four, oh, she took yes. my hand. And, you know, this, this little tatty girl in a refugee camp took the hand of the first world white lady. And in that moment, my fear just vanished. Now, she didn't, she didn't speak my language. No, I think her language is the language of courage and of compassion. And she just made that real human connection with me. And then she took me to a house where people were laughing and where they were having fun. And really, she introduced me to my my new community. And in that moment, I learned so much about leadership and just the importance of courage and compassion and connection. And, and when you told me that story, it was, it was heart stopping for me. And I just was like in such awe because we have these frameworks, uh, particularly in the corporate world, we have these frameworks of what a leader is. And here's this four year old little girl tattered in a refugee camp who teaches you what real leadership is. And, uh, and she does it without speaking your language. She does it without looking like anybody who had been familiar to you in your corporate world. Uh, and, and what a, as you said, her language is that it was that of, of courage and curiosity and compassion and just, wow. I just, I, I'm so inspired by her. Um, her name was? Ah. Uh. Nor Ace, she had a couple of names, which wasn't unusual for, for that area, but Nor Ace. Okay, that's. So, I mean, so Nor, Nor means Miss, so, you know, Miss oh, Ace. Okay, Miss Ace. Like, I just love that. Like, you know, like, Miss. <laughs> She's four. Yeah. Hello, Miss. Yeah. <laughs> miss Ace. Yeah. That's fantastic. That's fabulous. Now, you and and I, I was Theramu Rini. Theramu means teacher, and Rini is the short my short name. So I was Theramu Rini and, and the kids, when they spoke English to me, they would call me teacher Rini. And it threw me for a long time because I kept thinking like, Oh, you know, I'm not, I'm not that grown up. I'm not that clever. I, you know, only clever people can be teachers. And um, so it took me quite a while to get used to being called teacher Rini. But that, that right there, you see, again, is another lesson in leadership, isn't it? Because when we, oftentimes when we step into leadership, we are given a title, given a role, given something, and the, you know, there's that discomfort, like, oh, you know. And I think that that's a very normal response. 
to the having been given that. And at that point, you do one of two things. You, you back down from that title and you run away or you step in. And that stepping in is not a moment. But as you said, it took a while. And I love that. I mean, I love that you did that, that you stepped into that title. Now, you spent two years living in that jungle, in that refugee camp. Um, tell us a little bit more about that, because uh, as you said, the, you know, she was the first of the three leaders. Tell us a bit more about living in that refugee camp, because this is a whole movement towards leadership in a way that you now teach and, and write about, which is spectacular. So I, I, it was a, a jungle refugee camp. So this, I was in a small camp. There was 4,000 people living in um, bamboo houses made out of um, bamboo, obviously. And the, the, the roofs were thatched leaf. Mm -hmm. And so there was about 4,000 people in this camp. We had to walk along a narrow path for about 20 minutes to get into the camp. So there was no running water, no power, and sometimes no food. We got deliveries of rice, salt, and fish paste twice a, uh, twice a month. And wow. sometimes that didn't come. So it was, it was a pretty rough life. It was the only time in my life that I've had a, a, a bomb shelter dug under my house. And wow. you know, I'm, glad, I'm glad it was there. But really, it wouldn't have done much because when, you know, when the shells are falling, they fall right through bamboo. So it, it wouldn't have done a lot. No. Wow. <laughs> and there, there, was of, there was times when I was afraid. Like there was times when I was physically afraid. There was a period where... Um, I was the only foreign teacher where I was, but foreigners in the area were being targeted. And so there was a period where I was asked to sleep in a different house every night, not sleep in my house. And I thought, I'm not willing to do that. And I'm, I'm, I'm staying in my house. So there were times when I was physically afraid, but I was never afraid. I call it being afraid of spirit. And I was never afraid of spirit again after what that you, night. Tell, tell us what that means to you. Mm, That's fascinating. I don't think I've ever defined it before. I think when you're physically afraid, you know there are physical dangers. Like yes. when you wake up in the night when there's a curfew, so you know that people can't move around at night and you hear f heavy footsteps falling outside your house, that, then, you're fi oh, then I was physically afraid. Like is that our people just doing a recce around the village or is that the enemy that's come across the border? So I was right. physically afraid there. But I think afraid of spirit, physically afraid you can decide what to do. Whereas afraid of spirit, everything shuts down. And I think that's when the, I was going to say that's when the brain's flooded with cortisol, but I think that happens when you're physically afraid too. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure that I can define it. But it's, it's interesting. It, it, it's it's right through you. I think when you're afraid of spirit, it's right through you. It's not just a physical thing. It's, it's right through your whole body. And until you can get through that, then you can't deal with a physical fear. Mm -hmm. well, you, you, you know, you, you talked about that you never feared the same way again after uh, this four-year-old leader had helped you. And, and I mean, what an amazingly powerful experience. And, you know, you talked about living in this, this jungle refugee camp. You're in a war zone. I mean, this is not just refugees. I mean, you know, that in itself is horrendous. But this is actually in a war zone. And um, you, like I said, you spent two years there. Like you said, you were shifting around. But you released a fascinating white paper that I'm going to highly recommend that people get on guerrilla leadership. And one of the lines that I loved in that piece was, there's no business hours on the front line. Tell us a little bit about that. That's amazing. Okay. So I met a guerrilla fighter um, while I was in the jungle. He's, I actually met him on my very first weekend there. We made an illegal crossing over the border just to see what was going on on the other side of the river. And, um, and I met him then. So his name's Minthane. And so um, as a guerrilla fighter, you, you're working you know, 24-7, is, means something I think in the West and it means something because it's unusual. Like not everybody works 24 seven, not every gym is open 24 seven. So it means something. Whereas when you're a guerrilla fighter in the jungle, your business hours are 24 seven. So you, you don't say that. They just, they just are. They just are. And um, they, they just, so that's being constantly on duty, constantly aware and constantly dealing with overwhelm like like by definition you've got guerrilla forces we've got a small number of troops 
and they're typically out against a bigger, um, much more resourced, much more integrated traditional type army. And so Minthane was fighting um, in the, from the freedom fighters against the Burmese military. So uh, would, would it help if I just give a little bit of the history, Dove? Well, yeah, sure. Yeah, people uh, probably don't know uh, that Burma is now Myanmar, and they probably don't know some of those those backgrounds or, or the, the the coup and military. So, yeah, sure, give it a quick so people can have context. So, so Min Thane was a university student in 1988, um, and the students right across um, it was then Burma, right across Burma, led a democratic uprising. And so they were protesting peacefully in the streets. The Burmese military came in and literally mowed down the protesters. So they brought in, they brought in the troops, they brought in the tanks, and thousands of people were killed in the streets. All of those who survived um, escaped from the um, regional cities and the, and the capital to the border areas. And so they were right around right round Burma in the regional border areas. And they joined with, um, with the local groups and they were all fighting against the Burmese military. So they're fighting for democracy. So Min Thane was one of those. And so he was leading a platoon of about 10 men. And, and it's really interesting because we think about, and I quite often I'm asked here, what can I do to motivate my people? You know, what, what are the things that I've got? What are my toolkit? What's my toolkit for motivating my, my people? And the only toolkit, and the only tool in his toolkit really that Min Thane had was purpose. So he's motivating people every day to put their life on the line. You know, it's not just, you know, motivating them to work a little bit later tonight or to get this deal no. through over the weekend, but every single day to put their life on the line. And so some of his people believed in, um, believed in the democratic ideals. Some of them had seen their villages torched or their families killed. And so Min Thane's role as a leader was to align all of those beliefs around a common purpose, which is obviously what, what we all do as leaders and keep everybody moving. Yeah. In the same, in the same direction with the same spirit. And right. that's, that's purpose as a leadership tool. So that, I mean, obviously, that was a big lesson in leadership from Min Thane. Um, but Min Thane uh, went on from being a freedom fighter to being something else. He did. So, um, so, so Min Thane and I were friends for most of the time that I was on the border. And then we started to become more than friends um, probably about a year or so before I left, finally got to the point, my camp was being closed. All the camps were being consolidated into one big camp. It wasn't possible for me to stay there. Min Thane had been badly injured and couldn't fight anymore. And so um, I came back to Australia and he applied for refugee status and mm -hmm. then followed me back to Australia. And we now have two kids. That's and he, he works for the Australian federal government. <laughs> A little government. Yeah. <laughs> There's some <laughs> irony in that somewhere. <laughs> oh, there is, there is. Um, yeah. I, just another little story of irony. And I think we need to be so aware of this as leaders to how we can prejudge people. So mm -hmm. my beautiful uncle, who I love dearly, bef just before we knew Min Thane was coming, we finally had been given, um, you know, all of the paperwork was done and he was on his way. And my sister had arranged for a computer for Min Thane. So this was 25 years ago. So my sister had arranged for a computer. And my uncle said, what's Min Thane going to do with a computer? And I said, he's going to learn to use it. And my uncle genuinely said, but he grew up in the jungle. He won't be able to use a computer. I said, no, Pop, I'm going to teach him. And, and Ian's just... Not, not judging in a, in a nasty way, but just thinking, well, how is this, you know, poor Asian boy going to even learn how to use a computer? And so the irony is that within the federal government, he leads a development team coding software apps. So. And, and I, but, but it is irony, but it's also a marvelous lesson in leadership because yeah. in leadership, and I've said this for years, and I truly believe this with every part of me, and that as a leader, you have to be able to see in your people what they may not be able to see in themselves yet. And you've got to hold that vision long enough for them to step into it. 
even if it seems impossible. Because one of the things I know for sure is that the people who have the most impact on us and, and the people we have the most impact on are the people who see in us what we hold as impossible. When so we, true. It's not possible. And they go, it is. I see a champion in you in whatever that is. And, and that we step in blindly into their belief in us. And, you know, and your belief in that he could, oh, he can learn computer, you know, and just holding that vision and now him running a software division and actually programming. And all, I mean, it's just that for me, again, is another wonderful lesson in leadership. And, it, and it's fascinating because, again, that loop, that little girl walks up and she sees something in you you can't see in yourself in that moment that you're a member of this community. You feel isolated and terrified. She sees a member of the community who's on the outside that she's going to bring in. You know, uh, Minthane uh, sees uh, uh, a military run government and sees the potential, the opportunity for uh, a, de uh, a, a democratic movement and is willing to put his life on the line and supports others putting their life on the line to do that. You do it with him and because, I mean, this is like, so many stats and depth of levels around leadership in the way that people don't think about leadership because it's not just about barking orders. Because I wonder, for instance, I wonder how well Minthane would have done as a leader if he'd have just barked orders. Because I'm sure there were people doing that. Yeah. Uh, if he barked yeah. orders at the people he was leading, I'm sure that would have failed. And people go, well, you know, in a, that kind of situation, isn't that, isn't that appropriate? He yeah. wasn't. I I think that's so true. I think the other thing for Minthane is making strong human connections. And because he was able to make strong connections with his people, he knew when they were okay and he knew when they were struggling and he knew how to support them through it. And he was telling me, um, he's telling me a story just a couple of weeks ago that I hadn't heard before. Um, and because we're about to start writing a book together, whenever he starts telling stories, I make encouraging, mm, yeah, okay, what next? Well, I'm crazily keying in the stories that he's telling. So he was telling me about this time where there was- thing called phones with a recorder on them. <laughs> Maybe make it a bit quicker. <laughs> Oh, that's like a, a strike the bleeding obvious. I record everything else, but it never occurred to me to record mid vein. <laughs> so he's telling me about when they were on the top of a mountain and they were surrounded and, and none of them believed they would live the next day. Um, and, and there was one opportunity to get someone off the mountain because they had to get a message and a local had got through to give them this message. And, they, and, and so Minthane sent this, he described him as a kid. I think he was probably 19 or 20 out because the kid was afraid. And he thought, if I can save one person, this kid is the most afraid, I'm going to save this kid. And also if we've got a chance of getting out, it's not going to be if we're trying to support the kid because we won't leave the kid on his own. And so just, just those decisions that, um, that as leaders, we need to make in real time. I think the difference between what Minthane does and what so many of the leaders that I work with do here in Australia is if Minthane made a bad decision or a bad choice, actually, I don't think there's any, I don't think there are bad decisions. I think there are poor choices. And often you only know that in hindsight, but yes. if he made poor choices, then people didn't live until the end of the day. Whereas if we make poor choices, we might, you know, suffer an ego hit or, you know, lose a bit of money or launch a poor product. Whereas Minthane would actually lose his people. Yeah, I mean, it, it certainly puts things in context of what it really means to lead. Um, mm -hmm. And the truth of the matter is that you and I could, could have a whole depth of conversation just on that alone because, you know, um, you know uh, with my psychological background and you uh, understanding it, those things as well, you know, I want to talk about PTSD. I want to talk about about bringing that yeah. stuff with you and the, and the brain camp, brain responses to those kinds of things. Um, you know, we can go into that, but uh, first thing I want to do is I want to, I know that that, that white paper um, that you've created on guerrilla leadership, that's available, right? People can go download that from your website. Yeah. Yeah. So we a... I, mean, I will give you a chance at the end to, to give people access to all of the great resources you have, but I would like for you to tell them where they can go find that right away. Uh, so CorinneArmor.com, double R and double N, that trips people up all the time, including me. Um, 
And then there's a free resources page. And on that page, there's the Guerrilla Leadership White Paper. Okay, so we'll just make sure that we put that into the into the show notes because I do want people to have that. I read it and was, like I said, I was fascinated by it. It was a great story and it talks about that little girl and it talks about Mintane. It talks about, as I said, that there are no business hours in the jungle, which is pretty cool. So that, that's uh, very, like I said, we can go there for a long time. Um, you know, business now uh, often requires us to manage and lead people remotely. And very often those are people from different cultures different cultures than our own what have you learned about yourself and about leadership from being in a cross-cultural marriage because you know i i i see all these lovely romantic movies and you know the italian guy or the italian girl with the you know the american and, and it's all very romantic and as somebody who's a, a master in communication skills uh i go you know that's such bullshit because language is lost in subtlety you know, yeah. and so, uh, you know, and, and oftentimes that shows up in humor. Somebody's really upset and you don't know why, because you cracked a joke, particularly if you've got an Aussie sense of humor or a British sense of humor, you know, there's a lot of stuff that is like, boom, that was the Concord to anybody who's not even from there and speaks English as a first language. So, so tell us what it's taught you about leadership being in a cross-cultural marriage. I think that humor thing is so accurate. And the, a lot of our humor, I didn't realize until I brought Minfame back to Australia, comes from the TV programs we watched as a child. And I actually watched very little TV, but those references, like Get Smart references, for example, that Minfame just looks blankly. Um, and the first time I tried to help him watch Monty Python, that was a complete disaster. But what Oh, he, my what God. He, <laughs> Talk about throwing he, somebody in the deep end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was, that was just plain. That was just plain silly. That was me. That was me showing off too early. I this think. parrot is deceased. It's no more. It's dead. What are you talking about? It would room if it wasn't nailed to the perch. It couldn't room if it had a rocket up his ass. Yeah, that's gonna go down well with a with a Burmese freedom fighter. <laughs> yeah. Not the Messiah. He's just a very naughty boy. He's a very naughty boy. Now piss off. <laughs> anyway, you and I can go off on Monty Python for a couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Back to the question. I think the thing I've learned most about being in a cross-cultural marriage is the depth of cultural references that we don't realise are there. Mm -hmm. So I'd lived in Minthane's culture for a couple of years, fully immersed in it because I was the only, most of the time I was the only foreigner. So I wasn't like, right. you know, I'd, I'd, I'd been to meet the in-laws. I've actually lived fully in his culture for quite a few years. Then he'd been here for a couple of years. And I remember when we got married, um, a couple of his Burmese friends were invited and they hadn't RSVP'd. And I was saying, well, what about Wana? Is Wana coming? Well, I don't know. Of course he'll come. And I said, well, I need to know if he's coming because mum needs to finalise the numbers for the caterers. And, you know, we have to pay for everyone. And then he just started shouting at me why do you care more about the money than about the importance of my friends? And you would want me to ring them up and be so rude as to ask them whether or not they're coming. And it was this hot, like it just went completely, completely blown out of the water around something that, that actually wasn't that important, but I didn't realize it was such an issue and I fell into it. But in the Burmese culture and particularly Mintane came from, um, a small town, nobody gets invited to the wedding. It is assumed that every single person in the village will come. Oh. And so you know, the, the, some of those cultural references run so deep and you can be fooled into thinking you know somebody and you understand them and they understand you. And then you get tripped up by things. And I see that in the workplace as well. And I see that even more so with leaders because you know, Adam, Adam Galinsky talks about the power amplification effect. So as a leader, anything I do is felt more strongly than anything someone more junior in the organization does. So, you know, if I criticize you or if I make a flippant comment or if I praise you, that has much, um, much greater impact if I'm in, in a perceived position of power. And so leaders can, um, accidentally cross these cultural lines without realizing and it has a much greater impact than if if a peer does that but but there's something interesting there 
I fully agree with you. I think the impact can be devastating. But the problem is there's a good chance because of that power differentiation that the leader won't know because the yeah. person will zip it up, they'll say nothing, and you've already started to corrode your culture and you don't even know it. And that cultural awareness piece is, I mean, we see it now with, <clears throat> with the Me Too movement, which is, I think is a good thing, but we need to be aware. And, and for me, it's like, that's another culture. And if you, if you sort of stomp around in that, even though you think you're powerful and you don't mean anything by it, it doesn't mean you're not gonna get kicked in the gonads because of it, right? And it's the same thing with this. So the problem with leadership and that power differentiation and the power amplification is you're likely to have a bigger impact, but you're likely to know less and less about it. And so you go, I'm doing a great job. So how do you, you know, because you've got this such a rich understanding of this, how do you guide leaders around this career? For me, it's a simple premise, uh, simple to understand, harder to apply. And it's the basis of my latest book. It's actually just ask. Like my, my latest book is Leaders Who Ask. And I'm encouraging leaders to have the courage to stop telling people what to do and actually start asking good open-ended questions that will lead to insight and lead to better understanding. Because there's a, there's a, I think there's a sense of a, a perceived risk that if I, when I tell, I've got a sense of control. You know, I've got a sense I can control a conversation. I've even got a, a sense to some extent I can control what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. But when I ask a good open-ended question, then there's, there's a, a risk there that the conversation will go somewhere place that I'm not ready for. And you know, there's a risk that you'll take the conversation somewhere that might make me uncomfortable. Um, there's a risk that I might ask you a question and then you don't know the answer. And then am I going to make you feel bad? Am I going to make me feel bad? And so we, we tend to play it safe, but in the long run, it's so much safer to ask. And that, that, you know, that plays out over so many levels. Yeah, and I, I want to talk a lot more about asking in the second half of the show. But one of the things I want to uh, bring up here, because it so relates to the asking and uh, it relates to the fearless leadership and, and, and even where you've been in the cultural thing and, and what you've experienced. Your keynote is ask more, tell less, build fearless cultures and save the world. Tell us about that, because that seems like. Uh, okay, did you just glue that one on the end? What are, uh, oh, oh, I'm uh, a little bit of tape. I'll stick that one on. T tell, us exactly. why, yeah. tell us why that's there. Any, anything, any conversation that we have, I think about Susan Scott who wrote um, Fearless Conversations. Mm -hmm. Not Fearless Conversations, sorry. Um, Fierce Conversations. Yep. And she said something like, um, no conversation is guaranteed to change the world but any conversation can. So mm. play it like it matters. And, and so I, what I, I say to people is you actually don't need to, I talk a little bit about Elon Musk. I talk about, um, talk about people who've done pretty amazing things in the world. You don't need to make massive waves in the world. You just need to embrace the kind of leadership style that brings out the best in people. And we do that by asking more. And if everybody did that, we actually would be saving the world and changing the world. Yeah, and again, you know, it's, it's I love that point that you make, which is that saving the world can be in little tiny ways, including asking a, a, the right question at the right time. I mean, I, and the analogy, best analogy I have of that is that you, um, I, I know this because I've had this experience. You can save somebody's life by asking a question. Yeah. Somebody who you don't know is on the brink of suicide, but because you asked a question that may have seemed no big deal to you, may have seemed, you know, not trying to save anybody's life, but actually save somebody's life. And, and that's why I actually asked you about the save the world piece, because I think that oftentimes we see things in, very first world verbose ways and it's like well you know if you're going to save the world i've got to be the next martin luther king i've got to be the next yeah. mother Teresa. i've got to be the next even elon musk or steve elon jobs or, send somebody up on to, to live on mars or 
Right. Yeah. But changing the world is one person at a time. Saving the world is one person at a time. And so I really appreciate you taking it taking the time to explain that because again it, that's why i framed it that way it's easy for people to go oh you know she just added this on but it's actually not it actually has a great deal of substance to it and it's an it's a it's an important piece of this message yeah it is there's a, a whole lot of different stuff happens in somebody's brain when we ask a question so in a dove if you've got someone in your team and you want them to do something you can just tell them what to do and they might listen they might do it and they might take a level of accountability for it. But if you ask them a really good open-ended question that gets them thinking, and then they answer it with insight, you know, insight sort of like that, ah, you know, that flash, I got it. Mm. I put these different things together and I've got it. Then right. that, that's inherently rewarding to the brain. And there's a hit of dopamine and that's a, the neurotransmitter that, that is associated with the brain's reward response. So we feel good when we answer a question with insight, the, the hippocampus is involved, which is the part of the brain responsible for long-term memory. So we're more likely to remember what we've Absolutely. come up with ourselves. There's an emotional component. So we feel good about it. We've come up with that thing ourselves because we've been able to sort of generalize across other stuff we already know. So we're more likely to be able to apply that solution to a similar sort of thing in future. So when, Leaders say to me, you know, people just keep coming and they keep asking me the same questions. I think, well, I know why, because you're telling them the same answer. Stop mm -hmm. telling them, start asking them good questions because that will build your engagement. It will help them feel more empowered. And eventually they'll come and they'll bring you solutions, not just problems. Yeah, I, I think you're so right. And uh, the whole neuroscience of asking is is powerful because, as you said, the reward system of the brain is, is it, 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 if you're telling somebody, you actually shut down their brain. Uh, and, and if you tell them and they don't understand and you're the leader, now we've got the power amplification thing, they don't understand, they may feel very uncomfortable with asking you. They, they're now their brain is flooded with cortisol, the stress hormone, 27% uh, of the frontal of the frontal lobe, the blood is cut off. They don't think as well. You know, it's a, it's a, it's the exact opposite response to what you're talking about with asking. Um, and, and asking can also uh, shoot cortisol into the brain because it's like, Oh my God, I don't know. And so this is why it's important how we ask. Right. So let, let's talk a little bit about that piece. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think that's the human connection. If, if I'm, you know, hands on hips, I don't know whether you can see me, but, you know, hands on hips, why did you do that? Mm -hmm. you know, grammatically, that's a question, good tick, but it's not a question. It's an no. accusation. Absolutely. Um, so you know, everything about the way we show up in the conversation is so important. Curiosity is critical. If I'm, if I'm asking a question with curiosity, then that takes the conversation to a different level. And if I've got compassion and empathy with that curiosity, then there's an absence of judgment. Now, the moment we start judging people or people feel that we're judging them, then the conversation shuts down. Um, so, and we need to listen. <laughs> I just, I'm, I'm working with an organization at the moment. We're training um, 160 leaders in the Leaders Who Ask framework. And so we've just finished, just finished the first round of workshops. There's been a whole lot of other stuff. We start the second round next week. And, um, and, and it's just fascinating the questions. They'll put really good thought into a question. They'll ask the question and then, okay. And then my next question is, no, 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 no. Just shut up already. You, you asked a really good question. That person has gone inside. They're thinking, just give them the space to answer the question. So this is, this to me is a really important point because I, I see this myself in the work that we do because we do a lot of stuff around asking uh, what we call courageous conversations and courageous questions. Um, yeah. And oftentimes people, as you said, they're, they're uncomfortable with asking easier to tell. Of course, we get that. Um, and so they'll ask a question, as you said, that is often an accusation that doesn't work and they go, oh, my people shut down. Yeah. Well, that's why. And then, as you said, they don't give people time to breathe into the question. And part of that is in how you frame it, which is what you talked about, about the rapport that if I, you know, and the analogy I give people all the time is I say, 
I want you to imagine that you are out in the city and it's a new city, you don't know that city and you need to get somewhere. Do you go up to somebody and say, how do I get to this place? And you go, no. And I said, well, why wouldn't you do that? And they go, because that won't get a good response. Oh, okay. And is that how you ask the questions of the people you work with? I don't think so. Maybe you want to ask them because maybe it is. And they go, what do you mean? I said, well, if you were asking the question in the city, you, well, how would you start? And they'd say, well, I'd say, uh, excuse me, I don't mean to bother you. Yes, you build some kind of connection, some kind of rapport. You do something to connect with that person before you even get to the question. And that is where I think that so often leaders go into the strategic thinking, which is, well, I've got to ask a question, strategy, question. Okay, I asked a question. Yeah, the subtlety of it is where, it, for me, everything comes down to the subtlety. That's what yeah. is the nuance of the thing that's so powerful. And that's what I love about what you're teaching people here is it's not just uh, don't tell, ask, but what's the subtlety of that? So take us a little deeper into that road, if you would, Karim, because I think that this is a powerful lesson, um, which I'm sure, and I, I don't know, maybe you maybe you've, dug into this enormously for the new book of where you're going and the book you're writing. But I'm sure that you had to learn the subtlety of questioning uh, a in living in a culture that was not your own and B in being in a cross-cultural marriage. Because if I ask um, in Aussie, if I ask, cause you know, as you know, I lived there. Uh, if I ask, uh, are you being a wanker? And I'm in Aussie, nobody's offended. Right. It's like, you know, it's like, you know, you're being, a, you're being an idiot. Right. Uh, and you're kidding. If I ask that same question in the UK, I'm going to get punched in the nose. It has a yeah. different context altogether. And it's that subtlety. So teach us a little more on that, Corinne, because I know you've got so much value to offer there. Yeah, I, I think one of the important things is to look for people's intention and not just their behavior. So if I, you know, intention is, we know our own intention, it's clear to us inside, but it's often not clear to others. And, and when, as leaders, when we're working with people, we need to get past the behavior because often it's the behavior that's annoying and potentially dysfunctional. What's the intention of that? So can I give you an example? Might, Please might do. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm working with an executive team at the moment and, um, there's a guy, a guy, Mike, and there was a criticism. We, I, I, I facilitate a really open feedback session. And so there was some things shared that hadn't been shared until that point. And a couple of people said that Mike doesn't pay attention when things get really serious and we're trying to have an important conversation, Mike tunes out and he doesn't pay attention. And so the conversation loses momentum and peters out. And Mike was horrified because for him, when the conversations get tense, he concentrates more. And the strategy that he'd learned for concentrating, he had, um, oh, what's that thing where you don't concentrate well, particularly as a child? Um, uh, yes, that's it. And one of the strategies he was given is don't stare straight at the person because that'll, that'll heighten your, your fidgetiness. Look into your peripheral vision. And that'll help you, that'll block out, it'll soften what you're seeing visually and it will allow you to listen more deeply to what's being said. So when the conversation gets to that point, he consciously moves himself into his peripheral vision so he can hear more deeply what's being said. But to the others, he was tuning out because he wasn't paying attention to them. Up until that point, he was. So they lose confidence in the conversation. So by the time he's listening well enough to be able to respond, the conversation sort of reached an abrupt end. Mm. And, and so this was an executive team that worked together for many years, very successful organization. And yet what they would, they were judging the behavior they saw and there was no curiosity about what's the intention behind that. So for us as leaders in this space, it's, it's, that's the behavior I'm seeing. What's behind that? And how do I understand what's behind that? And how do I help the other person understand what's behind that? And if I find myself kicking into judgment, you know, well, that's just, you know, because he's an idiot. 
then mm. then curiosity is the antidote to judgment. Yeah, I love that. I mean, obviously, you know, we've had conversations about this, that curiosity is my primary driver inside of myself. Mm. Um, and it's what I learned as a kid. It was actually what allowed me to survive. Um, but the challenge I'm hearing uh, from leaders is, you know, everybody's intention's good. Because if you, if you say, well, ignore the behavior and look at the intention, every, well, everybody will argue their intention was good. I mean, they didn't mean to be bad, right? That's true. But are you willing to be curious? And I love that you're, you're, you're driving that. Because if you don't, you're, you are going to judge on content and not on context. And the context yes. for, that, for that leader you just talked about was, I want to focus more. That is my context, is I want to understand at a greater level. You know, it's interesting because I was working with a, um, an international leadership team and we had nine CEOs in the room uh, from the divisions of the company. And <clears throat> they talked about one of the leaders inside of that group. And it finally came out that they were really frustrated with him. And I said, why? And they said, well, when we get into these deep, powerful conversations and things are moving along, he will agree. And he's like, yes, that's a good idea. And then he'll come back two days later and go, no, I don't. And they go, we've already got things in motion. And, and, and they were frustrated with him and he felt like he was a saboteur. And I said, do you, why do you think that is? And you know, they went through their own reasons. And I said, what if, and I said, I'm just going to ask you, why do you think that happens? And I went around everybody in the room and got their framework because we look at people, as you said, in our own judgmental lenses and we see them. And you know, they all came up with their sh shitty stuff, which we've all got, that's okay. And then I got to him and I said, why do you think you do that? And he goes, because I do agree in the time. He goes, but it's just how I work. I go, I think about it more and then I get to see the, the, the objections I have to it. It takes me a little bit of time. And I said, so here's the thing. You are, many of you in this room are fast thinkers, and that's great. But he's a fast responder, but a deep thinker. And he, they went, what? I know, and like it was like, you know, their minds yeah. are blown. Um, yeah, he can fast respond with all of them, but he's a deep thinker. So I said, so you, you've got to, unless it's an absolute emergency, you've actually got to say, we are not going to make the final check on the box and say yes for 48 hours. And I said to him, I said, Alan, if you had that 48 hours, what would happen? He goes, oh, he goes, I know exactly what would happen. And I'd be crystal clear. And I was yeah. like, fantastic. Now, is that frustrating for the others? Yes, of course it is. Because they're all fast thinkers. They want to move things fast. But the truth of the matter is they lose the value. And, and, I, and I said, and I put it forward. I said, let's walk this out. What happens if you, you know, he comes up with these objections. Of course, you've already said yes, and things have already got moving, and that's great. I said, what happens about two months later? And what well, his objections there, were the game changer, and we didn't hear them. And the global CEO said, so often, it's exactly what he objected. He has this, this ability to think out into the future that we haven't done, and yeah. we would have been better off slowing down a bit. Yeah. And I just yeah. said, and what does that cost you? <laughs> right. And so Absolutely. it's that same thing. And I just, I love that you're putting that forward to people to have them ask, not just from the simple asking, don't tell, but the depth of that ask and where it's coming from and understanding to move away from the, the pre framing of everybody else into the curiosity. Yeah. Yeah. For, for me, that, um, that conversation around decision making that you've had, is a lot of the work that I do with executive teams. And it's really about helping them understand their purpose and then understand the, um, the communication protocols that they need between them so they can leverage that diversity. Because I think, I think we're, all, we're all good on diversity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we've got someone who's, you know, someone who's this, this religion and this cultural background and this gender. Like we can tick those boxes now because I think intellectually we know diversity is good. But if we can't leverage it, and you've just given a classic example of thinking diversity. If we can't leverage that diversity, it's no good to us. And that's where we need to step from diversity to inclusion and to really be able to use all the different perspectives that we've got around the table. 
Yeah, uh, I did a video that I put out and I said, uh, in that video, I said, the worst advice you ever got was surround, your, uh, surround yourself with people who, who think like you. That's think terrible like you. advice. That's yeah. terrible advice. Uh, because everything in social media thinks like you, right? That's how the feed works. You actually mm. need to surround yourself with diverse thinkers and people who, who are going to object and think differently because that's how you get smarter. But, you know, yeah. it's, it, anyway, that's a whole different story. So is, <laughs> is, is this really about, you know, because in the book you actually say it's not. Uh, let, let me rephrase that. The title of a, of a chapter is that it's not. Is it, is it about leaders being coaches or is it in a different way? No, it's not about leaders being coaches. I think coaching is a very different skill set and the right. specialist skill set. I mean, it's not, if, if we send leaders on a first aid course, you know, we've got quite a few leaders who are first aid trained. We don't call, bring them back and call them doctors or nurses. We bring them, we say, this is a leader and that one's got first aid training. Right. So it's a, it's a tool that they can bring into their toolkit. And I think this is the same. If I, I don't think leaders taking a coaching approach to any, to everything is any more useful than leaders taking a command and control approach to everything. It's a, it's situational and it's what's, what's the type of style that is going to be the best right now in this situation for this group of people with this outcome that we're looking for. And it's giving people more skills to put in their, in their toolkit. And in fact, I, I say to them, not every situation is a coaching situation. And I, I usually, um, I give them an example of when I first learned coaching skills and I came home and Minthane had a problem and I thought, oh good, because I've, I've got a framework. And so I started coaching him and it was not pretty. And, um, <laughs> and, and so I know, I learned very, very fast firsthand that not every situation is a coaching situation. No. And I say to the people that I'm training, I guarantee you there are a lot more situations to use this in than you believe right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, talking, talking of that, um, you are, you have, you, you mentioned earlier, you have two daughters, you have a family that you love, but you're also in work that you love. And, and that in and of itself is diversity. How do you, you know, because I want leaders to understand, how do you work with juggling those two loves? Because I often say this to, to the leaders I work with. If you're a leader, there's a pretty good chance that you're in love with what you do. If you're not, then you should really quit. But there's a pretty good chance that you're in love with what you do. And that can be very hard on a family um, yeah. because it can often, uh, particularly in entrepreneurial situations, um, the business can feel like the mistress, you know, or, or, or the, the affair to the, uh, to the business, right? Uh, the business can feel like the affair to the marriage. How do you manage to juggle those things? Sometimes brilliantly and sometimes not well at all. Um, I, I'm lucky in Thank that Minsane has let his career be secondary. So I worked really hard when he first came to Australia. I supported him. I coached him right through uni. And I, I, I invested a huge amount in helping him get to a point in his career where you know, he, he felt more like he had something. Um, in the last probably three or four years, I've been the primary care out till the last three or four years. And now Minthane does more. So he travels a lot less than I do. So, um, you know, next week we've got a conflict where we're both away. And so he's coming home a night early and the nanny's going to stay late. So, you know, we do things like every family does. But I think what I do, I work too hard and too long when I'm working, but I also take... I take six weeks, five to six weeks off at Christmas. I take a week off every school holidays. I take three weeks off in the middle of the year. I usually add an extra day to every long weekend. You know, Australia is known as the land of the long weekend. So I always add an extra day to every long weekend. So I also have the opportunity to do a lot of stuff like that too. And mm. we're actually moving to the country at the end of this year. And so for me, that's another really important lifestyle thing. And my business manager and I are working on how we structure my diary. So it'll mean a little bit more time away from home. It'll also mean more quality time when I'm at home. So oh. I, th I think there are trade-offs and I, know I always say that being a working parent is there's a fine line between brilliance and disaster. And usually it's something that you don't predict like a kid's sick or a 
a flight yeah. gets delayed or something <clears throat> like that. But I it, think it is, if, ever I feel, so if, if ever I feel uncomfortable um, about, you know, was I around, you know, I missed that concert or you know, most things I don't miss, but sometimes I do. And then I think neither of my kids ever in their life ever would have heard me say, I don't want to go to work tomorrow. Never. Yeah. So what a they, wonderful model. They, yeah. So they, they, they have, um, they know it's possible to not just be doing a job every day. That's a grind. Yeah. That's beautiful. That's, that's really fabulous. This has been awesome. And I'm, I'm, I've loved this conversation. We're not over yet. We're just moving into the lightning round. Are you ready for the lightning round? Okay. What's the lightning round? I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> so what makes Corinne cry as in sad tears? Um, what makes me cry? I only cried a few days ago. What was it about? Oh, yesterday. Yesterday was, is Are You OK Day in Australia. So you talked before about sometimes if you just ask one question, you could save a life. So mm -hmm. Are You OK Day is, is mental health. And I was reading a note on LinkedIn that somebody had posted that that was a suicide note that he had written many years ago. And then he'd got help and he actually hadn't suicided. And, and that made me cry. And it made me cry because there's two, two people sort of not close to me, but in the next level around me who suicided in the last couple of months. And I just think, you know, that, that makes me cry. The, the thing that drives me is potential. Mm -hmm. um, living to my potential, helping other people live to their potential. Like when I talked about living in a refugee camp, when you've got hundreds of thousands of people living in a refugee camp around the country, some people would say that's a political problem, but I reckon it's a leadership problem. And it's a leadership problem that produces massive, massive waste of human potential. Mm. So, and that's why I do what I do. And when someone commits suicide, I just think it's so sad that, that they weren't able to find a way and, and we as a society weren't able to find a way to help them to be here. So in anything that's a massive loss of potential is, makes me cry. Yeah, and it's interesting because, as you know, uh, all those things are a lack of connection. And yeah. one of the best ways to make a connection with somebody, ask a question. So it's yeah. really great. What makes you cry laughing? <laughs> Monty Python. I and, knew and it was going to be that. I knew it was going to be that. I don't know. What's the word like when you're watching something through a mirror? The double take of watching Minthane not laugh and Monty Python. <laughs> <laughs> and he's standing there like this is funny yeah yeah when do, when do i laugh <laughs> exactly that is awesome what is a guilty pleasure for you ah uh, what is the guilty pleasure oh we visited a, a wine region in south australia um a, a last holidays really nice sweet sticky dessert australian dessert wine ah very cool. In a, in a parallel universe, what do you do? What do you mean in a parallel universe? Parallel universe. Another universe, you, you're, not, you're not doing what you're doing. You, you get to uh, okay. something else altogether. Travel. Travel. You just travel. That's all you do. Uh, I would travel. I, if I, I would travel and I would do what I do now, but I would just do it occasionally in select places while I was traveling. No, nah, that's not a parallel universe. That's one where you just got more money. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, parallel universe, what would I do? I've always wanted to surf. And, yeah, and I'm surfer. really uncoordinated. So I'd be a surfer. Yeah. That Fantastic. would require a big, that's a big parallel. Well, that's a parallel universe. That's great. That's what I love. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, I know on your website, there's also an opportunity for people to get a, test, uh, a taster of the questions that you put forward for leaders to ask. Um, it's kind of a snapshot of your methodology and people can find out more about it there. Can you please, this has been wonderful. I've enjoyed it enormously. Please tell our, uh, our listeners, our viewers, where they can find out more about you, where they can get that taster, where they can find out about the, uh, the Gorilla Leadership and all the, the wonderful resources that you have. All right, so please connect with me on LinkedIn. 
And mm. my website is www.corinnearmor.com with a double R and a double N. And if you go to the free resources page, then you can download um, the Gorilla Leadership White Paper. You can download the quick reference guide to some of the leaders who ask questions and you can get a couple of chapters, sample chapters of the book. And of course the book's available on any good online bookstore. Fabulous. Well, again, Corinne, thank you so much. This has been an absolute pleasure and a joy. Thank you for all that you've shared. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you. It's been fabulous to talk with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, you can hang out with other conscious leaders and chat about this episode or any past episode by simply going into our Facebook group or our LinkedIn groups. They're under Leadership and Loyalty Podcast. You can find them there. You can also find out about hiring me, Dal Varen, as a speaker or a strategist for your organization by simply going to fullmontyleadership.com forward slash consulting or fullmontyleadership.com forward slash consulting. Please be aware that the research consistently shows even the fastest growing companies face exactly the same challenges that you might. And that is that they're spending time, money, energy, and effort attracting, training, and developing top talent only to have them leave at an alarming rate. If you're frustrated with investing in the training and development of your talent only have them leave before you get your ROI, then come talk to us at fullmontyleadership.com, where we provide the essential leadership skills to rekindle and amplify the hidden loyalty assets inside of your organization by tapping into purpose. fullmontyleadership.com, because you can't outsource authenticity. Also, remember to stop by the Matrix, Matrix like the movie, dot fullmontyleadership.com. You don't need any W's in front. And you can get your authentic leadership matrix self-assessment tool. It's valued at $197. It's absolutely free for tuning in. And I want to thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. Till next time, stay curious, my friend. Stay curious about the questions you can ask and the way you can ask those questions that might actually save the world. I'm Dolph Barron. I'm here to assist you tapping into the into your deep greatness to reach that next level of clarity, focus, purpose, and profit in your business, your life, and your leadership impact. And I am out.